My name is Walid Shuibat. I come from two parts of this world. My mother is an American. Met my father in Humboldt State College. Now it's Humboldt State University in California. She fell in love with my father. And she was nine months pregnant after she got married with me. And she, and, uh, she decided to take a trip to the Middle East for a visit. And during that visit, she gave birth the first day she arrived in Bethlehem, Israel. And she wasn't permitted to go back to her country. She couldn't use her return ticket. She was given this child with a birth certificate that says father Muslim, mother Christian, the son Muslim. So my religion was decided for me instantly at my birth. I didn't have a choice in that matter. I grew up from two sides of the family, an American family and a Middle Eastern culture, Arab culture family. My Arabic grandfather, he was a Mukhtar, the chieftain of the village of Beit Sahur, Bethlehem. He was a, notorious, a friend of a notorious figure by the name of Hajj Amin al Husseini. I don't know if you've ever heard of this figure. He was the Supreme Muslim Council. He was a regular guest at my grandfather's house. Hajj Amin is also seen with photographs with Adolf Hitler on the eve of the final solution to the Jewish problem. In fact, Hajj Amin al-Husseini urged the Hungarian Prime Minister of Foreign Affairs not to allow half a million Jews to go back to the land of Israel. All half a million Jews died in the Holocaust as a result of his plea to the Hungarian Prime Minister of Foreign Affairs. From my mother's side, uh, my great-grandfather was well-connected with another notorious figure by the name of Winston Churchill, who wanted to destroy Nazism. I know very little about my mother's heritage, her side of the family. Winston Churchill was, was a, you know, would visit my great-grandfather in Eureka, California every time he got to the States. I have newspaper articles even to prove it. And I knew very little about my mother's faith, how she felt about things and her religious convictions or her Christian convictions. And, uh, you know, we were, my father was stationed in Jericho. And in Jericho, I remember at six years old, I remember the uh, Six Days War. I remember we were clamoring behind Jamal Abdel Nasser to destroy the Jews and throw them into the sea. I remember many things from my childhood. I remember Israel won in six days, and they kind of rested on the seventh day. And Rabbi Goren blew the shofar at the Wailing Wall and declared Jerusalem the eternal city for the Jewish state. Of course, uh, my father was crushed. My mother was kind of elated and very happy because she said it reminded her of the story of Joshua with the walls of Jericho, because the story of the Joshua conquest was the six days war as well, because on the seventh day, if you look at the biblical text, it says very clearly early in the morning before the sun came up, they went around the walls of Jericho seven times and Israel basically was established as a state. So she said that as a Presbyterian, she studied that in uh, Sunday school and it was pleasing to her. Of course, I had no choice in the matter of what school I went to when I was a young kid. Third and fourth grade, I remember going to a Christian school. My father and mother put me in a Christian school so I could learn English as an early language, as an early, you know, at the early stage, because they didn't teach English from the first and fifth till the, till the fifth grade in the government school in the Palestinian areas. I remember one time I decided to walk into the Bible study at our school. And I wanted to study what the rest of the kids were studying. And the bully stood up. He wanted me to leave the class because, number one, I was an American. Number two, I was a Muslim. You know, you don't belong here. The teacher said to him, you know, you better shut up and sit down because it seems that he's the only one that wants to learn the Bible. So I learned uh, my first year, third grade, good Bible study. Fourth grade, my teacher, Hani Aude, was a Palestinian Christian. And there we learned the different Bible studies. Basically, we learned that all the patriarchs of the Bible, Abraham, Moses, even Jesus of the New Testament, were all Palestinian revolutionists. In fact, if you don't believe me, you must believe Hanan Ashrawi, the right hand 
of Yasser Arafat before he croaked, she said that Jesus was a Palestinian from my country. You can see that on clip as well. So, because tonight everybody here is expecting me to pick in one side. Some people think I'm an Islamophobe, I'm a racist or a hate monger. Tonight I'll pick on everybody. I will pick on Christians, I will pick on Muslims, I will pick on Jews. Because it's one thing to pick on somebody without looking at the log in your own eye. I will pick on the Christians because we didn't learn proper education in our Christian schools back in the Palestinian areas either. In fact, at Columbia University, which Ahmadinejad was allowed to speak, just a speech like this, the public weren't allowed to come in here or speak, yet Ahmadinejad was allowed to speak, and I made it my position to criticize Christendom equally as much as I criticized Islamdom. And by the time I finished my speech and the question and answer time came, the first comment came from a student, Walid Shu'ibat, you are an Islamophobe. Then I asked the question, I said, if I'm an Islamophobe, why didn't nobody call me a Christian phobe? After all, I exposed Martin Luther, the reformer, who wrote the Jews and their lies as something that is evil. Why did nobody call me a Christian phobe? Why am I only titled as an Islamophobe? Because we live in a culture that you are not supposed to, you can criticize any religion. But when you criticize Islam or you critique the religion of Islam, you have some sort of hostility or some sort of a problem because in the Muslim culture, it's a different culture than the Western culture in which if you criticize the religion of Islam, it is considered racism from that culture. However, in the American tradition, the American way of life, criticizing any religion is a freedom of speech. I grew up finally going to the government school from fifth grade all the way to high school. And by the time I reached high school, I remember my educators, Sheikh Naim Ayyad and Sheikh Zakaria, graduates from Al-Azhar University of Egypt. Al-Azhar University of Egypt is the largest university in the Middle East that graduates Muslim scholars and Muslim clergy. It is the number one university par excellence in graduating and producing Muslim scholars. And by the time I got to high school there, I learned the art of martyrdom, the art of shahada, that the most noble thing in your life is to die as a martyr. In fact, I remember the very verse in the Quran that we had to learn in school. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ Do not think that the ones who die in the cause of Allah are dead, but are alive with Allah receiving His blessings. What kind of blessings? No, it's not 70 virgins. It's 72 mansions with 72 beds, and on each bed, 72 virgins. In fact, we learned eschatological education as well, because I get also criticized for my speech regarding Christian or biblical eschatology. Walid talks about Jesus coming back and, uh, you know, creating Armageddon. I get all these kind of criticism. However, I remember my is Islamic eschatology that uh, I memorized it even in the Arabic language from the Hadith. لا تقوم الساعة حتى تغلب طائفة من المسلمين طائفة من اليهود قيل أين يا رسول الله قال في بيت المقدس وأكناف بيت المقدس The day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and in the surrounding nations and then the trees will cry out and the stones will cry out the غرقد tree will cry out there is a Jew hiding behind me come O Muslim come and kill him such as the solution to the Jewish problem. The women, of course, are to be taken as captive because it's not permitted in Islam to kill the women. I remember question and answer time. Students were curious, asking questions. You know, you said we can take the Jewish women as captives, captives of war, and you also said, uh, Mr. Ayad, that we can consummate our rights with them and have children from these women. Well, he gave us the example of the Prophet Muhammad when he killed the Jews of Banu uh, Quraida. He took the tribesman leader and consummated his right on his way back to camp in a tent. And one student, I remember, asked a question. He says, well, isn't that considered adultery because you're not married to this woman? 
He says, no, it's not adultery. One student asked the question, he said, is it consensual? And he said, it doesn't have to be consensual. I went to my father, I asked my father, I said, father, we're learning this in school. What is your opinion? You taught Islamic studies and English language. He says, you will have the river of Al-Kawthar to back you up. We will kill the Jews in that day. This is why they're back here in this country. So we can finally annihilate them. And you hear speeches all over the Middle East from Lebanon, from Nasrallah, from Ahmad al you know, uh, from all over the circles from the Islamic fundamentalist movement that says that the Jews come back to one place so it makes the job much easier for us so we can continue with the Holocaust of the Jewish people. Of course, you know, from my social studies, whether it's history, I never took a trip to Yad Vashem, even though Israel showed footage on the Holocaust. I remember our first TV set, black and white television set. Uh, we plugged that television in. It was the time of Yom Hashua for Israel, where they would show days of footage of the Holocaust. I remember watching the Holocaust footage, eating, eating popcorn with my sister, my brother, and you know, by the time I went to school, we asked the teacher questions about the Holocaust. You know, we were curious. What is the stuff they're showing on television? Of course, the Holocaust was a Zionist fabrication. It was a Zionist conspiracy. In fact, many of my critics say that I've been paid by Zionists to speak here in front of you tonight. Uh, the Holocaust was a conspiracy. It was a fabrication in order to establish the Zionist state. Well, where did they find all these scrawny bodies? What kind of a diet plan were the Jews on so they can fabricate this whole story? Not being able to go to Yad Vashem, not being able to you know, live a Western kind of a culture. My mother, however, all this time, for 35 years, she wanted to escape back to the United States of America. In 55 Muslim states today, not one of them is signatory to the Hague Convention which means if a Muslim decides to marry a Christian girl or a Jewish girl, and he decides to go back to his homeland, and he decides to keep the children back in that country, there's nothing that your embassy or your country can do for you because they, don't, they, don't, they are not signatory to this convention because they feel that they have an obligation towards Muslim children who have a right to live in Muslim countries and not to be evicted back to a Christian country. Her attempt was always to escape. She wanted to run. Her whole story is, how can I escape? I remember my mother's first attempt to escape when we were children. She took the luggage, and you might think it's very easy. You just pick up your luggage, you pack your things, and you get on the taxi cab, you go to Ben Gurion Airport, you take the next flight to New York, and you connect to California and go home. Well, she tried that. She took the kids, and of course, the you know, women from the balconies would see her with the luggage, you know, and they knew what she had in mind. Uh, she had to go to the embassy and do, file some paperwork because she had no passport, she had nowhere to prove who she is, and she had to spend one night at the YMCA hotel in Jerusalem. And the second day in the morning, she attempted to go to the consulate general, and of course, you know, my uncles, my family, my father realized what she was about to do. They waited for her at the entrance of the American consulate. She was, of course, caught and sent back to the House of Obedience with enough beatings to teach her a lesson. At this point, everybody in my family, in my school, even the barber, will tell us how not to trust our mother and not to escape back to America. The Americans, of course, in our school were taught as imperialists and what have you. And now her dilemma was, how can she escape with all three children uh, and having to convince those kids to go with her? Because at any inkling my mother wanted to escape, we ourselves as kids will turn her in. She would not want to leave the country without all three children. So for 35 years, my mother remained captive in a system that she didn't want to be part of. She wanted to escape all her life. She couldn't leave until 1994, because in 1993 I decided to change my religion, and I became a Christian basically, and rescued her in 1994, brought her back to her country, and she is with her mother, you know, back to her family. And it's really her story that needs to be told. Because the question I always ask, 
is whenever you hear a story of a Muslim girl falling in love with a non-Muslim boy, a Hindu or a Christian or a Jew, and being allowed to marry this, this, this guy. It's always the case of a Muslim male marrying a non-Muslim female or a Christian girl, and you never hear the vice versa of the story. I have very rarely ever heard of such a story of a Muslim girl marrying a Christian boy. It happens maybe on occasion, but the majority of the stories is always that a Muslim can have the right to marry a non-Muslim girl. Of course, living in the Middle East, going to Friday prayers, going to the Temple Mount, listening to sermons by uh, Ikrim Asabri, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Even the Wailing Wall doesn't belong to the Jewish people. I went to school all my life in Dar Jasser in Bethlehem. And in Dar Jasser school, I was right adjacent to Rachel's tomb. Never knew who Rachel was all my life there. Who was Rachel? Qabr Rahil. Didn't understand who Rachel was didn't understand the history of, the, of Jerusalem or the connectivity of the Jewish people to that land. Of course, you know, from you know, listening to all the sermons, religious education, social studies, historical studies, you know, we were the original Canaanites. We had the presence in, our, in this land way before the Jewish presence because we wanted the connectivity to the presence to this land way before the Jewish existence or the Joshua conquest. So we were the Canaanites. You can hear Yasser Arafat, Faisal Husseini, all the prominent figures of the Palestinians saying that we were the original Jebusites or we were the Canaanites. I began to ask myself a question in 1993 as I read the Bible because Canaan was the son of Ham. How could Canaan be a Hamite? And we consider ourselves Arabs, of course, Arabs from Ibrahim, from Abraham. How could we be Canaanites and uh, Hamitic origin and also a Semitic origin at the same time. Of course, you know, I began as a youth, as a graffitist. I began to write graffiti on the walls. I began to entice other kids to go on demonstrations against Israel. The idea of destroying Israel have never left our mind in school. Of course, the Israel education system didn't allow an Israeli system to enter into our school we had our education curricula coming from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and it didn't have any of the open kind of a critical thinking that you enjoy here in the West to think critically or to ask questions. In the Middle East, all my life I lived there, there's usually one party line or the coffin. I mean, you could be a pro PFLP, Popular Front to Liberate Palestine, you could be pro PLO, you could be pro Hamas, but one thing we were all pro is that we had the idea that Israel must be wiped out and we must establish a state. In fact, I always ask myself the question, prior to 1967, the Palestinian Charter never even included the land that we call Judea, you know, uh, the West Bank. It was never included part of that charter. What happened? I mean, after all, we wanted to establish a state in Palestine Yet it seems like the secretary forgot to type Palestine and, you know, in that land we call Judea, biblical Judea, as that state. Because we were proud Jordanians. I was considered a Jordanian. My father served in the Jordanian army. We saluted King Hussein in going to theater or go to school. We had the Jordanian national anthem. We were all Jordanians. And all of a sudden, after the Six-Day War, the charter was changed. And now Palestine is to be established in that land called Judea. Well, Palestine was supposed to be established in Israel proper, where the Jews were. It took me years to realize why. Well, it's because the idea of establishing a, a Palestinian state when King Hussein ruled it was an anathema. You know, I mean, he's an Arab ruling Arab country, and Gaza was ruled by uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser, Egypt. So Gaza was considered Egypt. There was no problem with us being ruled by other Arabs. The idea was to be, you know, rejection of being ruled by a Zionist or a Jewish entity. But I never considered racism as part of our life. Because even asking my family, at a family reunion in San Francisco, I had my uncle, my aunts, my cousins, everybody was there, their children, their children's children. We were all having a family reunion and I was asking questions, you know, I'm living in America here. 
how was life for you back in Palestine? Now you have Yasser Arafat, you're supposed to be happy, you have somewhat of a state now. How was life for you back in the Palestinian areas? Well, my uncle says, life is miserable. I says, why is it miserable? He began to tell me how Yasser Arafat and the PA really abused uh, people, had a, a monopoly over businesses, uh, you know, territorial monopolies. The PLO was very dictatorial. I said, well, how was your life in comparison with your life under the Israeli occupation? I remember what they said. They said, well, under the occupation, those were the good old days. I said, excuse me, I couldn't hear, I couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. What do you mean the good old days? Those were the good old days. Life was good, there was tourism, there was money to be made, education, everything was good at those times. Now it's really, really miserable. I said, why don't you speak out? And my uncle says, that's a stupid question. I said, why is it a stupid question? He says, you know very well, Walid, that we will never accept the Jews to rule over us. I said, excuse me? Then the issue is not an issue of a state or land, it's racism. I began to understand racism. One Palestinian was asked the question, if all the Jews converted to Islam, will we still have an Arab-Israeli war? And the answer was, of course, no. But then the question is, it's not an issue of land, is it? It's an issue of Jews ruling over land that was waqf at one point in time. It was a waqf territory, it belonged to Islam because Umar ibn Khattab had occupied it at one point. It is a Muslim land. In fact, historically speaking, I began to realize after I began to study history for a change that the Arabs, and those are the best historians that you can find, the Arabs ruled that land you call Judea less than 100 years. Less than 100 years, the Arabs ruled Judea, that land. All of it was Mamluks, it was the Ottomans, it was the Romans, it was the Crusades. So it was the, you know, so why not establish an Ottoman state or a Crusader state or a Roman state? Why an Arab Palestinian Muslim state? And this has been my argument from a long time ago that this idea of creating the state called Palestine is going to end up not a mini America, but it's going to end up as a mini Iran. In fact, I was on Fox News one time and I was sitting there and I had a discussion with uh, one of the Fox News teams over this issue. And uh, he says, for your information, I always supported a Palestinian state. What's the name of that guy in Fox News? Big mustache. Uh, somebody can... Geraldo Rivera, yes. <laughs> well, I was... <clears throat> he says, what are you in for? He says, I'm a Palestinian. I came to have an interview with Bill O'Reilly. And he says, you're Palestinian? I said, yes, I'm Palestinian. He says, for your information, I always have supported the Palestinian state. I said, excuse me, you're talking to the only person who doesn't support the Palestinian state. <laughs> I said, Mr. Rivera, I'll be glad to make a bet with you. This was before the Hamas election, before the elections, before even Hamas even came to power in Gaza, before... I said, I have a, a bet to make with you. I said, it's going to be an election there, and we're going to have a Hamas stand. It's going to be an Islamist state. It's going to be a very oppressive state. There'll be no rights for women, no freedom of speech. I'm willing to make a bet with you for $1 million that Hamas will be victorious before the elections. And would you make that bet with me? He said, of course not. I said, why? It seems, Mr. Rivera, you know the facts already. And you look at the news, you look at everything that's happening, the facts are so clear what has evolved as a result of that state. But there's nobody in this politically correct world that could stand up with some guts to say what we have now is not a state, but what we have now is indeed a state of psychosis. It's a state of psychosis in which you see two Jews getting lost in Ramallah and they being lynched, thrown out the window, which is really, if you think about it, it happens in every culture. I mean, people kill people in every culture. Okay, well, somebody's going to object and says, Walid, you know, murders happen all the time. But the difference between our culture and your culture is that in your culture, if such event happened, you don't have 
the entire men of Ramallah standing there in the middle of the square in Ramallah on photo, in film, praising as loud as they can, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You don't have this kind of culture here where you see body parts and internals and intestines in a platter in which the children are coming and carrying pieces of the body parts, praising Allah in a euphoric fashion. That doesn't exist in this culture, but it exists in mine. I mean, after Israel left, and nobody wants to have the guts to say it, my country has become the night of the living dead, literally. Not allegoric, literal. People, bodies being dragged in the streets of Bethlehem and Ramallah and everywhere. People being lynched upside down for their support to Israel. In fact, I have five minutes to live right now if I decided to go back to my country. Five minutes, why? Because I simply changed my religion. I simply stopped believing that Allah is God and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. I am a kafir. As a kafir, I must die. In fact, I remember when I began to express my views to my family, I got a phone call. We always get a phone call. I got a phone call from my brother. He says, I talked to your uncle back home you have no more land. Your land is gone. Confiscated. I said, by what right? I have the deed to my land. I purchased it with my own money. He says, you've changed your religion. If you want your land back, you must go back to Bethlehem court, Sharia law, and declare the shahadatan. Go back to Islam or else you will lose all your land. So I had a follow-up question, question and answer time. I said, then the Jews didn't steal my land. All my life, the Jews stole our land. All my life, I knew very well that Tahir al Husseini sold land to the Jewish National Fund. My grandfather sold land to the Jewish National Fund. The Supreme Muslim Council sold land to the Jewish National Fund. Yasser Arafat's uncle sold land to the Jewish National Fund. My grandfather was going to be executed for selling land to the Jewish National Fund by Hajj Amit, by uh, uh, Abdul Qadr al husseini the leader of the Palestinian Revolution, for selling land to Jews way before the establishment of the State of Israel. The Jews didn't steal my land, you stole my land. I began to realize that in my culture, you can't change your mind. I changed my mind and I want to speak at a university. And the Muslim Student Association went up in arms. Why? In Michigan, the Muslim Student Association issued edicts, leaflets out, outside, how I'm such a false guy, how I'm made up, I'm a Zionist conspirator, I'm a lying, fabricating liar. In fact, they said even the mentor of Walid Shu'ibad, I was mentored in the United States of America by uh, Jamal Saeed. I don't know how many of you know Jamal Saeed. He's been said to be a colleague of Abdullah Azzam, the mentor of Osama bin Laden, who's free in Chicago right now. He's free. Bridgeview Mosque raised funds for Hamas. I have him on video. All the truth is the truth. And they said, there is no Jamal Saeed, he doesn't even exist. I said, if you get your spelling correct, it's J-A-M-A-L-S-A-I-D Saeed, not S-A-Y-E-D. You would Google the name and you'd find out for yourselves Till today, they haven't even issued an apology for their mistakes. I don't know what to say. I, basically in 1993, I began, 1991 actually, 1991, something began to change about my life. I took a trip to Israel. I wanted to visit home. Here I was a Muslim sitting in the plane and next to me was a Jewish lady. I didn't want her to even know that I was a Palestinian. I never really talked to a Jew all my life living in Palestine. The only language I knew was the bad language. I can tell you some Hebrew bad language that I cussed through the fire line when and all the demonstrations that I went through. I began to have a chat with her, but I didn't want her to know that I was an Arab. 
So I didn't roll my R's. Ma'am, my name is Bill, I'm from California. You know. <laughs> I'm going over here as a pilgrim to visit the Holy Land, you know. Uh, I disguise myself as a Christian, you know. And she began to talk to me, you know. I said, wow, oh, first time I'm talking to a Jew. I began to ask her a question, ma'am, do you have any children? She said, well, I have two daughters in the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces. Wow. I said, ma'am, how do you feel that your kids kill Arabs? I mean, they're in the military. They shoot Arabs in demonstrations. They kill Arabs. How do you feel about that? To my shock, she began to sob. Took out my handkerchief. She began to wipe her tears. I said, why are you crying? She says, I hate the idea of my daughters killing Arabs. We love Arabs. Maybe she uncovered who I am. So you love Arabs? She says, yeah, we love Arabs. We got no problems with Arabs. Then I went, of course, Israelis check thoroughly if you're Palestinian. They give you a different card versus a white card for the tourists because my birthplace was Jordan in the passport. So I had to go to interrogation and all kinds of things like that. And of course, I had to exit in a different area because, again, I'm Palestinian. There's more security precautions. And as I met my uncle on second, third day, fourth day for the whole month, I've been taking trips all over the land. And during those trips, I remember getting in the car with my uncle and there was something that kind of was unsettling with me. I wasn't used to the graffiti that I saw all over the walls. Because I lived in America for a lot of years and I'm not used to, I used to gang graffiti. I said, uncle, I can't find a square meter of wall in the entire country. You took me on a tour to Ramallah, everywhere. I couldn't find a square meter that didn't have graffiti. What kind of graffiti? Well, one of the graffiti was saying, نَقْرَعُ أَبْوَابَ الْجَنَّةِ بِجَمَاجِمْ الْيَهُودِ we knock on the gates of heaven with the skulls of Jews. Uncle, why must we enter heaven by knocking on the gates of heaven with the skulls of Jews? Isn't there a different way to go to paradise? And then I took a taxi cab one point. I wanted to go to Hebron. I went to Hebron in this taxi cab from Jerusalem. And by the time I reached Hebron, there was an incident that happened in front of my own eyes that really began to change my mind. As an American critical thinker, I began to ask myself questions. There was this mob of Arabs who began to stone this Jewish bus of Kiryat Arba. There was a community called, called Kiryat Arba that used to take this Jewish bus, you know, Israel, you know, and take them home. And as I looked at this bus, I could barely see the bus from the amounts of stones that were being hailed like locusts on this bus. You can look at the bus, you can see bars, wire mesh, and bulletproof glass. And I began, you know, the guy wanted to make a U-turn and get out of the situation. I said, stop right here. I want to see this. So I rolled down my window, and I looked in awe. He says, why are you surprised? I said, I'm surprised because I'm asking myself the question, why are these people not allowed to live amongst us? I mean, we have 1.2 million Arabs living in Israel proper. They go to mosques. They pray towards Mecca. They are full free citizens. They can vote. Why are they allowed to live there, but Jews are not allowed to live in Palestinian proper? Why is that? Of course, that's a stupid question. In fact, it's a stupid question even in our Western culture. Because one Jewish rabbi had a bumper sticker in his car. It says on it, Jerusalem for the Jews. I said, Rabbi, you got the wrong bumper sticker. You need to put a bumper sticker that says, on top of it, that says, Mecca for the Muslims. I said, why? I'm not a Muslim. I said, just put the bumper sticker, Mecca for the Muslims. And when somebody stops you and asks you, why are you putting this bumper sticker, Mecca for the Muslims, then peel off this bumper sticker, and show him Jerusalem for the Jews. Ah! A Jew walks on the Temple Mount and it's a problem. The whole world is up in arms. 
The Pope makes a statement and the whole world is up in arms. Effigies of the Pope being burned all throughout the world. But yet one set of dogma fits, but it doesn't fit for these guys. These guys are allowed to be that way. We're not allowed to have critical thinking to criticize a religion. Criticizing a religion is not racism. Criticizing a religion is a freedom of speech. I had many family members who died. I look at it back and as I rewind back, I look at my cousin Ra'id, the 16 year old boy who wanted to go and put explosives on Ben Yehuda Street to kill Jews. Of course, the Israelis, when they know you have explosives in the car, sometimes they shoot first and they ask questions later. What do you want him to do? You want it to be American style kind of justice. Okay, sir, you have a right to remain silent. You have a right for a Jewish lawyer. He has a couple of shekels and you can make a phone call. Chick, boom, everybody dies. My cousin Ryan, 16 year old boy, didn't deserve to die. He was killed by Israeli bullets, yes. How did my family react? My aunt Fatima, she had a wedding festivity in the village. A wedding celebration. And the entire community came to congratulate my aunt Fatima because now Ra'id is in heaven. He is interceding for 70 members of his family so they can also enter paradise. All my life as a Muslim, I criticized the Christians because the Christians believed in Jesus and his blood redemptive act that, you know, remitted sins and wiped out all the sins of mankind if they believe. Because Islam as a religion rejected the idea of intercession. You can't intercede. Nobody can intercede for somebody else to go to heaven. That's the Islamic dogma. No Muslim will disagree with me with that. No one can intercede for somebody else. Yet as I began to think about it, I said, wait a minute. My cousin Ra'id sort of became like Jesus now. Because by the first drop of his blood, his sins are forgiven. Now he can intercede for 70 members of his family. So they can go to heaven. My first bomb maker, Mahmoud al-Mughrabi, his cousin, Dalal al-Mughrabi, famous, killed 36 Israelis in a bus. Everybody was proud about it. She's a hero. Mahmoud al-Mughrabi in prison decided to recruit me to plant a bomb to blow up a bank in Bethlehem. Of course, I obliged because the explosives are few. And the applicants are plenty. Everybody wanted to die from the youth. We have created a generation that loved death more than they loved life. And I planted this bomb. I was in the Temple Mount, Al Aqsa Mosque, smuggled by the Muslim Waqf police who were supposed to be protecting the holy site into escape route so the Jewish soldiers who check you, the checkpoints outside, of course, they have checkpoints. They harass Palestinians, you know. And I planted my bomb, exported 6 p.m. No one was killed, thank God. Because now I look back and I had blood in my hands. In 1993, I began to spy at the Jews. I walked into a synagogue one time and I wanted to listen to what the Jews talk about in the synagogue. At this point, there was a speaker coming to town in Walnut Creek, California. He was speaking about the situation in Israel. His name was Moshe Al-Ad. As I listened to Moshe Al-Ad's speech, he was talking about rebuilding, building the Haitian camp, putting apartment complexes for the Palestinians in Haitian. I couldn't believe my ears. Jews want to build an apartment complex for the Palestinians, for the refugees. They want to solve the refugee problem. But he was having a trouble and a problem trying to convince the Palestinian Authority, the PA, the PLO, to allow them to build an apartment complex for the Palestinians. They didn't want to build a complex because the Arabs wanted to keep this situation with the Palestinian refugees as a site for sore eyes to keep this argument all the time, day in and day out, refugees, 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 refugees. Question and answer time, of course. I raised my hand. 
I said, Mr. Al-Ad, fine speech. You want to build apartments for Palestinians. I admire that very much. Mr. Al-Ad, I have one question to ask you. I'm not interested in your opinion, Mr. Al-Ad. I'm not interested in what you have to say. And why you ask me a question for? I said, I am interested in your feeling. I want to know how you feel. Mr. Al-Ad, how do you feel as a Jew? Yahudi. To give up Judea, Yahuda, to your worst enemy. How does it feel? He said, it doesn't feel good. I said, why do you Jews always do things that doesn't feel good? Because Olmert, in Minneapolis, you know, he's ready to give up Jerusalem. We have to have a state, you know. We have to have this psychotic state because the world wants to enforce it. Because if you give the Palestinians land, you ultimately will have peace. If you pull out of Lebanon, you know, finally you'll have peace. When Israel tried to respond to Hezbollah, what happened? Katyusha rockets, missiles, all kinds of things from Qassam rockets all over. And the world stood still. And when Israel retaliated and began to attack the groups of Nasrallah, and of course, civilians died. Civilians always die. Condoleezza Rice said we must have cessation of hostilities. Yom Kippur War, as the Arabs were winning, the United Nations did nothing. As soon as Israel turned the war around, we had a resolution come out, cessation of hostilities. In fact, the hardest thing is to speak at university campuses. Because at university campuses, everybody wants to carry a placard, you know, blood is more precious than land. Jewish students raise these placards during the peace process. Blood is more precious than land. Give land. Well, I could make the same argument. My wife and kids are more precious than my house. Leave the windows and the doors open. Apartheid wall. Jimmy Carter. All this basura that I read in the West that talks about Palestine, peace, not apartheid. Then I listen to Jimmy Carter on the television. He's a Christian, you know, like me. And Jimmy Carter says the Christian fundamentalist movement in America should keep their mouths shut. They shouldn't be active politically. Christianity is not about politics. Christianity is a relationship with God. Okay, then why did you write a book called Palestine, peace, not apartheid? Is that not politics? Ah, in other words, you're allowed to talk about politics, but I am not. I began to ask my family more questions. I wanted more answers. I began to ask my father. I said, Father, you were saved by a Jewish doctor in Jerusalem. Dr. Bernaba in Jerusalem saved your life. You had a blood clot. You had a week to live. And your father, my grandfather, took you to Jerusalem to a Jewish doctor. And you even told me the story that the Jewish doctor saved your life. Do you ever make a dua, a prayer for the doctor that saved your life? Maybe God bless him and bless his children. He says, there is only one prayer we have for the Jews. لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ كَمَا لَعْنُمُ اللَّهُ عَلَى لِسَانِ دَاوُدِ كَمَا لَعْنُمُ اللَّهُ عَلَى لِسَانِ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمِ Cursed be the Jews, as they were cursed by the mouth of David, as they were cursed by the mouth of Jesus, son of Mary. Wow! Such appreciation for Hadassah Hospital. Then I went to my uncle Ibrahim. He taught Islamic studies on Al-Aqsa. I said, Cousin Ibrahim, you drowned in the Mediterranean Sea because you didn't want to see the Geverets, you know, the chicks on the beach, and you're religious, you went to a secluded beach, and there was no lifeguards, you drowned. Remember that story? He goes, yeah, I remember that story. I said, two of your colleagues with beards went in the water to rescue you. Both of them died. Then a Jewish passerby with a car saw the situation, took a couple empty gallons from the trunk of his car, went to rescue my cousin Ibrahim. And he swam, 
risking his own life and holding on Ibrahim and saved him back to shore. I said, a Jew saved your life. Immediately I was yanked from the scene by my aunts and my family. He says, don't you ever tell him about that story. I said, why? He doesn't like the memory of him almost dying. He goes, no, he does not want to ever think of a Jew saving his life. What's the problem with a Jew saving your life? After all, they make the best doctors and the best lawyers in the world. I heard the Jewish lawyer, he was phenomenal. I began to, uh, to ask myself, what is really the problem? Because every place I go speak, everybody keeps telling me what is the solution. And the problem is so obvious. You see it on television. You listen to speeches by Ahmed and Nijad. You listen to Nasrallah. You look at the camera. And Nasrallah says, وَنُكَرِّرُهَا كُلِّ عَامِ الْمَوْتُ لِأَمْرِيكَ وَنُكَرِّرُهَا كُلِّ عَامِ الْمَوْتُ لِإِسْرَائِيلِ As we repeat it every year, death to America. As we repeat it every year, death to Israel. And the camera turns around and you see hundreds of thousands in the streets in the middle of Beirut crying out, الْمَوْتُ لِأَمْرِيكَ الْمَوْتُ لِأَمْرِيكَ And the American people still haven't woken up. And smell the hummus. Ahmadinejad comes and he makes a speech about the Mahdi. The blessed Mahdi is going to come. And I am the religious fanatic. Pat Robertson is the religious fanatic because he believes in Jesus coming back to establish peace. We believe in the Messiah that's going to establish peace. It's a defensive war. Because by the time I began to look at the biblical text, because I began to examine things, I began to ask myself questions in America. I began to do research. Was the Holocaust a reality or was it a fabrication? Did six million Jews die in the Holocaust or not? They did. Why did they lie to me? Critical thinking is a problem. Beginning to ask yourself honest questions is a problem. I began to look into songs. I began to go to garage sales to buy Jewish songs. I want to listen to Jewish songs to see how they sing. I'm looking for war songs particularly because as a child when I grew up, all the songs that we listened to from the Voice of Palestine, from the Arab stations, what kind of songs do we listen to? Maybe I can translate some of the songs. I can sing them even for you. I don't have a melodious voice. One of the songs that I memorized when I was a kid, I memorized all the revolutionary songs of Palestine. Sharpen my bones and sharpen them and make them sword. Fill me up as a Molotov cocktail. That's a song. Ya gatilin damkum halali alayna Wain antifirru min igabna wayna Oh, Jews, or oh, killers, your blood is halal to us, kosher. Where will you hide from us in that day? What day? The day that the prophet spoke about. When the trees will cry out and the stones cry out, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. We are a people of blood and march through the night and create bombs out of their flesh. We gatil with all gatil fights and continues to fight. Listen to all the Jewish songs. I began to learn a little Hebrew to translate these songs, but I wasn't good, efficient in Hebrew. I lived in Israel all my life, never learned Hebrew. Please, no hecklers. I have only one song. One song that had the word, because I'm looking for the word war, kill in Jewish songs. I found one Jewish song that had the word milchama. I know that word, milchama. Milchama is war, butchery, slaughter. I said, ah, there's the war song. I took it to a Jewish interpreter. I said, I want to know what this song is saying. And he said, sorry to bust your bubble. It says that the Gentiles will not learn war any longer from Isaiah. I said, where's the war songs? In fact, I asked anybody to produce me a Jewish war song. I lived all my life. The Jew was prophet killer. The Jew killed Jesus. 
The Jews spread mad cow disease. The Jews put infertility drugs for the Palestinians so they don't have children. The Jews caused tsunamis. The Jews causing earthquake on the Temple Mount. The Jews run the Congress. The Jews run the media. In fact, you think this happens only in Palestine. It happens in the heartland of America here. I was in Chicago demonstrating with the rest of the Muslim Arabs. Who runs the Congress? And the response is Israel. Who runs the media? Israel. In fact, even the MSA. We don't hate Jews. We hate Zionism. But in their demonstration, Khaybar, Khaybar, Ya Yahud, Jaishu Muhammad, Sawfa Ya'ud. Jews, we remind you of Khaybar. The army of Muhammad is coming back to haunt you, to get you. He's talking about the slaughter of the Jews. In fact, the first time I heard a moderate Muslim, I was excited. Los Angeles, Hanukkah, no, Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the largest synagogue in Los Angeles. I was a speaker there, I talked, and there was a moderate Muslim, I was excited. Mr. Jasser Judah Jasser, doctor, he's hated by many Muslims too. He finished his speech, I asked him, I said, Mr. Jasser, I have a problem. Here's the question I have for you. It was a private question, I asked him privately, I said, did the Prophet of Islam kill the Jews of Banu Quraida? Did he not expel the Jews of Banu Qaynuqa and Banu Nadir? He said, yes. I said, how do you justify it? How do you justify it? It's a problem. He says, well, they had a fair trial. I said, excuse me? They had a fair trial? Yeah, they had a fair trial. I said, why is it? that the West began to know that the Jews didn't have a fair trial. Why is it that even the Pope tried to make amends? He goes to Israel and he even prays at the Wailing Wall. Why is it that the whole world began to realize that Jews didn't really have a fair deal? Why is it only in us, amongst us Arabs and Muslims, that the Jews had a fair trial? Where do you go to an Arab culture or Arab society or Arab country and see maybe books on the Holocaust or books on the Jewish plight. Where do you see in the universities, here and even here in America, in which they talk about what happened to the Jews, not by Nazi Germany. Forget Nazi Germany. Because it's time I criticize the Jews as well. Because the Jewish communities in America, they like to have Holocaust museums. Holocaust museums galore. You know, Holocaust this, the Holocaust that. They try to pick on the dead Nazis. Nazism is gone, Hitler's dead. But they keep forgetting about fighting today's Nazis. Because when you're nervous, like I am right now, you must be doing something controversial. You must be getting a lot of heat. If you have heat in your life, you must be doing a job. But if you're in your comfort zone, you're doing nothing. Because to struggle in life is to face the heat. Is to say that the problem with my culture and the problem with my society is not an occupation of land. It's an occupation of the mind of millions of young children. Because it wasn't Israeli bullets that killed my cousin Raid. It was the religious institution in the Middle East from Al-Azhar University, from a Muslim Brotherhood. From all the apparatus, you have 400 Islamic terrorist organizations. 90% of them are Muslim. It's not the issue of occupation of land. Because Islamic fundamentalism rose by the founding fathers of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928. Way before the establishment of the State of Israel. Who created the state called Israel? It was our hatred that created that state. We hated them, not just in the West, but also in the East. 850,000 Jews expelled from the Middle East, from Muslim societies and universities, don't want to even talk about it. Two divisions out of the Nazi war machine of eight divisions were Muslim fundamentalists. The Khanzar division, the Albanian division, they were horrific. In fact, I get the argument all the time that Hitler was not a Muslim. 
Hitler expounded his views on Christianity to a visiting delegation of Arabs discussing the implications of the battles of Tours. Hitler held forth, had the Arabs won the battle, the world would be Muhammadan today. For theirs was a religion that believed in spreading the faith by the sword and subjugating all nations to that faith. The Germanic peoples would have become hires to that religion. Such a creed was perfectly suited to the Germanic temperament. And this is a quote by Albert Speer inside the Third Reich. There was a connectivity between Islamic fundamentalism and Nazism. In fact, even I was going to school in high school, we learned the Umar Declaration, the treatment of non-Muslims in a Muslim culture. Jews must wear a yellow patch under Islam, and they did. You look at the Khalifa al-Mutawakkil instituted the yellow patches for the Jews. Harun al-Rashid, hailed as a moderate, issued decrees that Jews must wear yellow patches on the right shoulder. Jews must never be judges in a Muslim court. Jews must never enter in a Muslim bathhouse. Jews must never ride a horse but must ride a donkey. Jews must pay jizya taxation by an upper hand in accordance to the Quran. That they pay the, Jew, the Jews pay the jizya by an upper hand. May they be belittled and may they be subjugated. Same thing with Nazis. Jews must never enter into a German restaurant. Jews must never enter must never be a judge over a German court, must never adopt German kids, must pay double the taxation from Germans pay. Because Americans think that Islam as a Sharia is simply a religion, like any other religions. Islam is simply a religion. In fact, yesterday I was on the radio and a Muslim caller called in to object to my speech. And he began to rant. He began to say, well, Islam, Sharia Islam, has to mandate establishing Islamic Sharia law all throughout the whole universe. Islamic Sharia law is a constitution. Can any Muslim tell me that Sharia is not a constitution? It is a constitution. They had a caliphate. Khalifa is the vicar of Muhammad, the prophet. It was dismantled in 1924. 1928, I never got to finish that point. In 1928, the Muslim Brotherhood was founded and then you had an attempt all this time from the Wahhabist and the Muslim Brotherhood to erect the Caliphate back. This is why you have suicide bombing, not just in Israel. This is why you have suicide bombing all over the world. This is why you have suicide here in America. You have suicide, this kind of thing. Islam prohibits suicide. And the caller says Islam prohibits suicide. But Al-Azhar University of Egypt issued a fatwa. Yeah, suicide is not permitted in Islam. But suicide is permitted only in the condition if it happens in the Israeli areas. Sheikh Yassin with Yasser Arafat were walking down the street one time and they ran into Osama bin Laden. And Osama bin Laden was having a hard day. He says, I'm trying to find a hole. You know, they just caught Saddam Hussein. He's hiding in a hole and I'm hiding in a similar hole and I'm trying to hide and I don't know where to go. I'm doing the same things you guys are doing. You get a state. I get hunted down by the Americans. It's not fair. I'm doing the same thing you're doing. Yes, Arafat looked at him and says, you fool. We're only killing Jews. We are only killing Jews. Can one man be right? And millions wrong? Yes. Winston Churchill, by American connection, was right. He was half Scottish. He was wise. He was hated in the parliament. He said Nazi Germany is not about just land. They want to take over the whole world. He was called a Nazi-phobe. Lady Astor in the parliament says Winston Churchill, said Winston Churchill, I hate you. I hate you so much, if I was your wife, I will put poison in your tea. He said, ma'am, if I was your husband, I'd gladly drink it. <laughs> as soon as I finish, 
My critics are going to criticize me for all sorts of things. But the question is, to my critics, are you fighting the real terrorist? Are you fighting the real racist? Are you fighting the anti-Semites? Are you fighting Osama bin Laden? Or are you simply fighting the Islamophobes like myself? Is care moderate? Is Council of American Islamic Relations moderate? Is the American Muslim Council moderate? You'll find libraries of their statements. You'll find much arrests of them being terrorists thrown in jail for their terrorist connection, funding, raising funds, and calling for the destruction of America. In fact, they clearly said that Islam in America is not here to be a mere religion. Abdul Rahman al Amudi and everybody else within his cohorts. But Islam is here to be the dominating religion. It is my duty as an American to speak out and to fight for this country, for my mother's heritage, for my Judeo-Christian heritage. I am the American. I am the one who is hated now. I am the one who is being hunted now. I am the one who has to live under an assumed name while they all live freely. I am the one who is being criticized. They would just love to sue you so you can just keep your mouth shut. Vigilance is the cost for freedom. Without vigilance, there is no freedom. And this whole thing with appeasement, appeasement is the process of feeding the alligator, praying he eats you last. You pray they eat the Saturday people first and the Sunday people next, then you can wait. But in the meanwhile, I will fight. Thank you very much.